Justice Brandeis talked about states being laboratories of democracy. Uh, and so I'd like to give you a report from the laboratory, uh, otherwise known as New York State, about our efforts to try to build the grid of the future, the smart grid, whatever we want to call it. So first, a little background on uh, the electricity industry structure. So you'll notice that there are some states in green and some states in, I guess, beige. Now, the states in beige are, have utilities that are fully integrated. That's most of the states in the country. And fully integrated means that they own generation, transmission, and distribution. In 16 states, the states in green, which you noticed are the Northeast and California and a couple other states on the West Coast, uh, the utilities, when we talk about utilities, they only own the wires. They don't own generation. Now, what's the argument in favor of a fully integrated utility? Well, it's the least cost to customers, least cost to what are called ratepayers. Well, why is that? It's because there's a regulatory compact in exchange for uh, the right to, to serve, the monopoly right. There's a regulator that's imposing charges on customers that they really must pay. And uh, the utility gets compensated through rates for the cost of providing the service plus a return on the capital that is deployed. And that's usually around 9 to 10%. Now, what's the argument in favor of non-integrated utilities, like California or New York, those green states? Well, ironically, it's the same argument, lowest least cost to consumers. And the reason for that is, well, generation isn't a natural monopoly. You can put generation anywhere on the grid, or lots of places on the grid. You're only going to have only one wire to your house, but there are lots of places for generation. So let's have competition for generation. And while, and, and the generators will get compensated through power uh, prices that they get in the wholesale market. And through that competition, that will drive down the cost to customers, even if the cost of capital for the generators is higher than for the utility. And I got to tell you that the data, I think, is, it's another lecture, is not clear as to which model, in fact, up to this point, is the better model. So in New York, as in California, when we talk about a regulated utility, we're just talking about the wires company. We're talking about distribution, transmission, not generation. And it, but it's the same regulatory compact. The regulator determines rates which compensate the utilities for the cost of service, and in the past, uh, provided a return on capital. Now, in New York State and in California, because I was in a meeting here uh, at, a, at a prior seminar, uh, the topic came up, well, aren't utilities compensated for how much electricity customers use? That is not true in New York, and that's not true in California either, because there's a mechanism called decoupling, which means the utility is completely indifferent to how much electricity customers use. They get compensated for the cost of service, reimbursed through rates, and they get a return on capital, not based upon the quantity of electricity that's used. OK, so we had a choice, because there's an increase in distributed energy resources uh, demands for that for all kinds of customers in New York. We had to make a decision. How should we treat distributed energy resources? We treat it exactly the same way. Utilities can't own large-scale generation. They're, they shouldn't own small-scale generation either. But the other point, and maybe the more significant point, is that we wanted entrepreneurs to bring innovation to the market. And one example would be, let's think about the solar lease, which revolutionized the residential solar industry. That didn't come from a utility. That came from Solar City. came from an innovator. OK, so we all know the grid of today, architecture of Nikola Tesla and, and George Westinghouse. We know that. And we have been bolting renewables onto this grid, which was never designed for these resources. That's not the way to build the smart grid. This is why we have a duck curve in California. 
This may be why we have problems with PG&E, because we've been bolting things onto a grid that was never intended for the resources that are being put on them. And we can't go on like this because we're going to need to electrify transportation. In New York, we're going to need to electrify heating. We're going to have to connect millions, billions of devices. The current grid is not set up for that. And so we have to change fundamentally the grid architecture. And we know kind of, we've seen these pictures before of the dynamic grid. So the question is, why aren't we building this 21st century grid? And it's because we have had policies and regulations that have, uh, that have us keep rebuilding the same old grid over and over again. And just in the same way that we've been bolting on physical aspects of the grid, physical assets onto the grid that were never intended uh, to be built on, to be put onto that architecture, we've been doing the same thing with a policy framework. We've had a policy framework designed to build the old grid, and then we've been bolting on policies. You want a solar policy? Let's bolt on a solar policy. You want an energy efficiency policy? Let's bolt on an energy efficiency policy. You want a storage policy? Let's bolt on a storage policy onto an underlying policy regime that was never intended for that purpose. So REV, Reforming the Energy Vision, was our approach, or has been our approach, to come up with a set of new policies and regulations designed to build the smart grid. And it's market-based. Now, why is it market-based? It's the obvious reasons. Markets mobilize large amounts of money quickly, markets bring innovation, and markets can bring efficiency. So the good news and this really is good news, is we know that the grid is energy inefficient. It was not designed to be energy efficient. But the grid is financially inefficient. And Arun talked to me, talked to, said that my background is in finance. My background is not engineering, but my background is in finance. So we can look at one measure of financial inefficiency is the grid's average capacity utilization. It's a little bit more than 50%. So think of it as a kind of a machine. So it's built for the hottest hours of the day or the year, hours of the days in the year, but customers pay for it through their rates all year long. Now, other capital intensive industries, and you can see a few on the screen, 35 years ago or so, they had really low average capacity utilizations. The airline industry, about 35 years ago, had average capacity utilization of 50%. Because of global competition, industries have had to become much more capital efficient through adoption of new technology, changes in financial incentives, changes in business model. So all these other capital intensive industries are operating at 80 or 90% average capacity utilization. But the regulated electric utility sector has been stuck or captured in a golden cage. It's been protected from the forces that have been going on in other capital intensive industries for the last 35 or 40 years. And so because the current grid is so financially inefficient, we believe we can largely build this new grid within the cost envelope of what customers are already paying. So what are the elements of REV? And there are lots of parts, but I want to boil it down into three pieces because it's these three pieces that are how we believe we can build the grid of the future. So the first is to establish locational value of DER. So we know that in our minds, this grid of the future has distributed nodes. But where are those nodes supposed to be? 
They have to be in places on the grid where those distributed resources are going to have the most value. So we can think about, as an example, an area of grid constraint. And every utility has lots of areas of grid constraint. This is New York State for those that don't recognize it. But the purple are areas of grid constraint in New York State. But we don't call them areas of grid constraint. I was a political appointee. You have to be sensitive to these things. We call them opportunity zones. <laughs> That's where you want to deploy distributed energy resources, as opposed to trying to pipe electricity from long, distance, from long distances through uh, transmission into these grid-constrained locations. If you put distributed resources in those locations, it has the maximum amount of value. It's good for those customers. And it's good for all customers. And it makes the system more resilient, too. So we, uh, this is the successor to net metering. We all know about the net metering battles that have taken place around the country, including in California. This was our approach to be the successor to net metering. And it's a value stack of things that we believe distributed energy resources represent. There's an environmental value. There's capacity value. Uh, there's what the energy is the next day and demand reduction. And we had to put in a little declining uh, uh, transition over time to make this work. And the value of this DER exceeds the net meter. Now, that's really good to create a price signal for DER to allocate DER where it should go on the grid. But it has nothing to do, this tariff, change in tariff, has nothing to do with utility compensation. Because as we said before, rates determine the total pot of money that compensates utilities for the cost of service plus a return on capital. So all you're doing by changing tariffs is providing a good price signal to the market, but you're not changing utility compensation. So the second thing is changing utility financial incentives and business practices. Now again, we've talked about this already. Through rates, utilities recover their cost of providing the service plus a regulated return on the capital deployed. The more capital deployed, the greater the utility profit. And the more capital deployed, there are higher rates to customers unless there are more customers to share the costs. That's the traditional utility business model. Now, what's wrong with the model? We could have a whole lecture on that, but I'll just mention three. First, we cannot be surprised if you compensate a business based upon how much capital they deploy, you're going to wind up with a business that has excess capital. The second thing, Stanford, technology, IT, you name it, it's revolutionized every other industry. In the case of the regulated utility business, this compensating utility based upon capital is a deterrent to adoption of new technology. IT may not be capital at all, so the utility earns no profit on it, gets recovered for the cost, but no profit, or it displaces traditional capital, which means there's a financial disincentive to deploy it. And the third, think about those areas of of grid opportunity, of those opportunity zones, if you don't get the numbers, financial incentives right, the utility will have no incentive to enable distributed solutions in those locations. Instead, the utility has a financial incentive to deploy capital to widen out the grid constraints. So this is a customer bill, typical customer bill in New York. So these are are the revenues that go through to the utility. The utility profit is 6 to 7% of the customer bill. 93 to 94% of the customer bill is a, are pass-through costs on which the utility earns nothing. Nothing. Now, every business that you know of, that 93 to 94% would be a wallet share opportunity. It would be the place where innovation would take place to figure out how you could, as a business, lower costs, improve value to customers, 
and earn more for yourself. That's not been an opportunity for utilities. So the old utility model, you commit com capital to build the grid. You get paid for how much capital you deploy. And again, in New York and California, you're completely indifferent to energy efficiency. Now, under REV, there's a new model. And that model is the utility is to act as a systems integrator. It gets paid still for the capital it deploys. And there's still plenty of capital it's going to need to be deployed. New York's got an old electricity system. Plenty of opportunity to continue to deploy capital. But the utility also can get paid for enabling more efficient deployment of other people's capital. Because remember, DER isn't owned by the utilities. It's owned by others. Those are other people's capital. And now there's a positive incentive for energy efficiency. So I'm going to give you one example. So this is uh, Brooklyn and Queens, for those not familiar with New York City, uh, to the uh, east of Manhattan, an area of load growth. And so the traditional solution would have been to spend $1.2 billion on new substations to satisfy that area of uh, demand growth. And instead of this, the utility, instead of asking for requests for proposals, the utility asked for a request for solutions, opened up and provided information about grid conditions in that location and projected demand in that location. And what came back from the market for these non-wire solutions, non-traditional, what we call non-traditional capital, non-wire solutions, were solar storage efficiency, combined heat and power, demand response, that in the aggregate cost $200 million, as opposed to $1.2 billion. So that's a billion dollars of savings to customers. And I'm not counting the the reduction in costs from uh, less peak power. When you can imagine how expensive peak power is to deliver into New York. And so this is a solution which saves customer money, save customers money, has fewer emissions, creates more resilience, and as this model has evolved in the state, still provides the same opportunity for the utility to earn as much money as they would have otherwise earned because the system is so financially inefficient. So there are a couple ways of providing compensation. One is performance-based regulation. You tell the utility that we're not going to compensate you for these alternative approaches. Another would be a shared savings model. We know that the difference between $1.2 billion and $200 million is a billion dollars, and so let's whack up those savings between customers, the utility, and the service providers. OK, so let's go back to this slide, which you saw before. Again, this is the typical customer bill. The largest percentage of that are power costs, 45%, almost half the bill. Again, the utilities don't own generation. They're just going to the market, buying power, providing it to customers with no markup. That's great. They're indifferent. Why not create a business where now the utility actually can start doing things to encourage energy efficiency? That turns it into a business. So now we can go be, take that same concept that was used for non-wire solutions, and now the utility has a financial incentive to reduce the power supply costs. And we'll see now if megawatts can really be a business for utilities. Now, the third is to stimulate grid ed edge activity with government resources. Now, when we talk about the grid edge and you know why is that important? Well, we know that a lot of action is going to be taking place at the grid edge. That's where there's going to be a lot of technology that's going to be deployed to balance the, the, the grid. That's where the innovation is going to take place in terms of what customers want from new technology and so on. Some of the things are going to happen anyway. Costs are competitive. Customers want it. 
But there are other things that are going to need a little help from government to get going. So in New York, we spent a billion dollars a year supporting distributed energy resources. 85% of that money went in the form of one-time grants. Terrific. But are we really creating scale? No. You're funding a bunch of little projects. So, you know, it's great to give a grant for a solar project on somebody's roof. But you're not creating enough to create a real market. So, you know, you've, I know you've talked about this here before, but soft costs really matter because a state, even a state as big as New York, even California, which is bigger than New York, we're not going to have an influence on the cost of solar panels. We're not going to have an influence on the cost of wind turbines. But we can have a huge inf impact on these soft costs of customer origination, installation, and so forth. And so, you know, solarizing, we didn't invent solarizing, but we got 40 some odd solarizing projects. And so we can do a lot to reduce, to get more value out of the dollars that we collect from customers because, again, all these support programs, where do they come from? They come from imposition on customer bills. All these clean energy programs, they're not coming from your taxes, they're coming from your electric utility bill. And this is a regressive tax. It's not fair and we can get more out of those dollars too. Now the other thing that we need to, why we want to care about this grid edge and figuring out the grid edge appropriately is we have to build an IT network on top of the physical grid. How are we going to build that? Well, it needs to have arguably something like your phone. The utility, there has to be a platform, and in our approach, our belief, is just in the same way that Apple doesn't develop the apps, but it has a platform, and there's a feedback loop between how Apple spends money to develop its platform from its engagement with the app developers. That's the same kind of approach we need to develop with the DER market and, to, and the building of an IT platform. It requires both something that the utility is going to do and something that the DER provider is going to do. And if a utility does it on its own, it would be like Apple or other platform providers trying to do it all on its own. You're going to wind up wasting a lot of money. So this is how the pieces fit together. We have value of distributed energy resource, the VEDER. That gives you price signal for where the distributed nodes are supposed to go. And again, those distributed nodes are going to be built not by the utility, but by the competitive markets. The utilities have a financial incentive now to enable those distributed nodes to occur as opposed to uh, being indifferent or being negative about having a financial disincentive. Utilities as systems integrators have the financial incentive to encourage renewables, DER, energy efficiency, electric vehicles. And as I just talked about, this utility and the competitive market actors together will, will build this IT system to help optimize the system. All of these things have to work together in order to build the grid of the future. They all have to work. You need to have locational value for DER. You need to have utilities that are systems integrators with different financial incentives. And you need to have a robust competitive market interface with the utility to build the IT system. So what have we learned so far? Well, this locational value for distributed energy resources has been a major step forward. We have broken the back of net metering, not just in New York, but arguably around the country. The, the using public dollars in a more effective way has also worked. Rather than just giving one-time grants to fund a project, this focus on lowering soft costs of customer acquisition and financing, reducing development costs, has worked. We, of course, still use subsidies. But now when we use subsidies, it's as a bridge to a sustainable market. And so it's everything from offshore wind. And if you've noticed, in the Northeast, offshore wind is really going to be happening 
And it's, a, it's, it's as a result of the same thing, focusing on aggregating demand, building demand, having a friendly competition across all the northeastern states. The second thing is uh, commercial building efficiency. Rather than doing a grant for commercial energy efficiency, we, give, we now give building control systems instead. And, and that creates a potential large market for uh, project developers that now have visibility into multiple buildings. Multifamily housing, same thing. We're aggregating demand so that the answer is going to be manufactured exterior building envelopes that will retrofit hundreds of thousands of units as opposed to just a few dozen a year, a few thousand a year. We have a green bank, which Arun talked about, even heat pumps. It's the same concept. Non-wire solutions, that same thing with Brooklyn and Queens. Every utility in the state now has changed its capital planning. Every single utility, all six utilities, and there are near, now nearly 40 non-wires projects underway. Now, that's great, but we could do more. Because if you think about the whole thing about if you have an alarm system, do you want missed alarms or false alarms? We've got this thing set so high that there are no false alarms. And arguably, we need to have a lower threshold so we have more transactions. So eventually, we can have some missed alarms, right? That's, that's, that's what we, we want to have. We want to have we can have more transaction volume because we need to have more transaction volume, not only at the utility, but at the regulator. We need to speed things up, have more transaction throughput. Now, another thing that's, that uh, we've now seen and can feel good about is we have a new utility model that provides financial opportunity for the utilities to improve earnings, growth, and return on equity in their regulated business. You know, there's been a lot of sort of chatter about the utility death spiral and the future of the utility. They've got tremendous opportunity. They have 93 to 94% of the bill to go after. And this is a path for there to have improved earnings growth and return on equity in their regulated business. And why is that? It's because other stuff that goes into the regulated business, other revenues, puts less pressure on the need to increase rates. So when we buy something, we're not thinking about what a company's return on equity is. All we are thinking about is what something costs. But if you tie the problem with the, from, from a political standpoint is if everything is on rates, then that's what political leaders and regulators see. If there are other revenues that are coming in and it puts less pressure on rates, that's the mechanism for greater earnings growth and higher return on equity because the prices won't be going up. Nobody, nobody is happy when their rates go up. But, and there's a but here, this new utility uh, model is a major test of utility business culture and practices at the utility and at the regulator. So I talked about the last 35 or 40 years of these other capital intensive businesses that have had changes in business model, changes in technology, changes in um, financial incentives. None of that has taken place at the utility. The utilities have been kind of stuck in amber. This is a major change. When you use the word business model, that has, I mean, that is a term which I think we all know what that means to, you know, that's sort of part of a lot of, le a lot of lexicon. It's a, in the utility world, that's a foreign concept. So let's just look at R&D as a sing, sing, single example. Utilities spend one-tenth of one percent. I've rounded up, by the way. OK? Is it really the case that there's no attractive R&D opportunities in the utility sector? Of course not. But this is not a fault of the utilities. This is also a fault of the regulators because we've not permitted the utilities to make investments in R&D and they can be compensated for it. This is why if you have things only be tied to getting paid based upon capital, you're not creating innovation. Okay, so I've already talked about this. The non-wire solution, that's really worked. 40 projects in the state, but we gotta go beyond capital 
to other parts of the bill. That 45% of the bill, that's uh, power cost. Oh, uh, tree trimming, we could have a whole different business model about tree trimming, right? Who knows what we could accomplish if we created the right kind of innovation and financial incentives for doing that. So the new utility uh, model requires different kinds of financial instruments. And what do I mean by that? Well, again, utilities can't own DER, but they can be compensated for the value of DER. They're going to be systems integrators. So we talked about, for example, megawatts or other things that the DER market could provide. So in order to, to get that value, a utility would have to enter into a contract to procure those services. You know, and they, need to, they also need to have the contract that's going to know that those resources are there. But the market's going to need to know that there's a contract because the market needs to go out. All those entrepreneurs need to go out and find those projects. They're going to need to finance off the back of those contracts. Those contracts, however, from the utility standpoint, those are financial liabilities. Utilities don't want to enter into financial liabilities. They need an offsetting financial asset. Maybe a shared savings contract that I talked about before. Now, the good news is that these instruments have been invented elsewhere in the economy, but they need to be adopted to the utility new business uh, utility business model. Now, one of the other things we've learned is markets versus mandates. So, a new system can't, and we're talking about a change in system, right? A new system cannot be developed on the basis of mandates. We didn't rebuild the telephony system by saying, well, this is how many modems we're going to have, or this is they're going to have that, this number of switches, right? We established some broad market um, and policy principles and let the market figure it out. That would be ideal here. The problem is, oops, I'm sorry. The problem is that the industry needs to know that there's a clear line of sight to a market. They want to, the industry needs to know, the storage industry needs to know that, or the, pick, I mean, any of these industries needs to know that there's a large economic prize. So the lesson here is that we believe that uh, the policies should drive the mandate as, as opposed to the mandate driving the policy. And what I mean by that is that the mandate drives the policy. What happens is that that turns into be a recipe for spending a lot of money. If you design the policies, such as the policies we've come here, then you can establish a mandate that comes out of what you think your policies are going to achieve. So the IT platform. I got to say, we haven't done a lot on the IT platform. And there are a lot of questions which remain. Who's going to build what on this IT platform? I said it's going to be, some parts got to be done by the utility, some parts got to be done by the competitive markets. I don't know who's supposed to do what. I have an intuition that at least the, probably the less the utility can build, probably the better. But it also then goes to the competitive market to step up to figure out what they're going to do. And I haven't seen a lot of that take place. What gets built first? What is essential for everybody? Or can it be built in pieces? Can it be built like a coral reef? Or do we need to have a single platform? And what about this whole question of data access and security? So. Just as an observation, going back to that first slide about the beige states and the green states, there are only 16 states that, have, uh, that are structured like New York and California. 34 states are integrated utilities. So I ask you, is it going to be possible to build this great IT system that we're going to need to have in those 34 states? that have integrated utilities, where there isn't this interface between the competitive markets and the utility. I think it's going to be very hard to do that. 
Again, it's Apple trying to develop all the apps. So one last point. I know there's been a lot of talk in California about municipalization. I think you would see, based upon what we've been talking about here today, that changing the ownership of the utility isn't likely to change the problem or the solution. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Richard, for that uh, extremely um, inspirational but also very clear-eyed talk. I think uh, nowadays we need people who are uh, optimistic but realistically so. So I think that was a great starter. So now we'd like to have some questions, if it's okay with you. Sure. Okay, Sarah's going to cover that. I'll cover this one. Students first. Uh, hi there. How do you think leaders in the fight against climate change can help developing countries? Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I jumped the gun. I thought there. you were my conscience there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start over. Um, so how do you think leaders in the fight against climate change can help developing countries begin with grid infrastructure conducive to distributed resources in order to uh, encourage renewable energy generation as opposed to uh, building what we have now and upgrading later? Well, I'm not an expert in, in uh, developing countries, but what I would observe, because I've had the opportunity to, uh, to uh, on behalf of the State Department, to go to a few countries, uh, including Nepal and Brazil. You know, Brazil is in a different economic uh, position than Nepal, but they're, uh, but what I observed in both places is that just in the same way that we've, um, We've exported our technology in the uh, electric utility sector, the architecture. We've exported the same policy regime, too. So uh, a lot of the things that I'm talking about here, I think we can uh, help share to other countries. So the same point, system integrator, value distributed energy resources, I think that there should be uh, I think utilities should not own generation, and I don't think of either large scale or, or small scale. So there are quite a number of things uh, in terms of the policy and framework that, uh, as I say, can be adopted elsewhere. What are the political challenges to getting this legislation changed? OK, so the good news is we did none of this legislatively. We did it all administratively. And the reason why is because nobody was really happy with the old system. OK, so let's go through it. Well, the utilities, you'd say, well, why do they care? They don't own generation. They have this regulatory arrangement where they get paid for the cost of service plus return on capital. Who cares? Well, they recognize, utilities recognize, that business as usual wasn't going to be so great for them because they could see that the world was changing and they weren't participating in the growth part of the market. The other thing that was happening is that, um, and we're certainly going to see this in California, uh, as the cost of distributed solutions continued to decline and there were reliability issues, so we had our share of storms in New York, those customers that could afford to reduce their reliance on the system, we're going to do so. And the way we allocate the cost of the distribution system is based upon how much volume you consume. That's where volume comes in, not in terms of how much profit the utility gets. It's about the allocation of the cost of the distribution system. So that means, and that's one of the problems, by the way, with decoupling, which sounds really great, make the utility, doesn't matter how much electricity people use. What that means is that if I have energy efficiency in my house. My share of the distribution system goes down, and Arun's share of, Arun's share of the system goes up. So th what this does is, over time, creates a dynamic which is really negative for utilities, because it means the distribution costs get spread over fewer and fewer customers, which encourages more customers to leave the system. So utilities weren't happy. Well, the innovative energy companies weren't very happy either, because they said, look, we can do a lot more storage. We can do a lot more s solar. 
you know, give us more grants. Well, there's only so much grants we can give. But the interesting part is the generators weren't happy either because that really low average capacity utilization is lousy for the electric generators because it means they're not making much money either. It means that a lot of their revenues are coming from capacity payments, just being available. That's low quality revenue. So it's the fact that we had nobody really happy gave us the opportunity to do things administratively. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for coming. Um, what do you think of the rumors of the California state government stepping in to own PG&E, the poles and the wires? I, I mean, I don't know anything about the rumors. I just, as, as I say, I don't think municipalization, I think municipalization has lots of issues. And, you know, if you think about, uh, do political leaders really want to be in the business of determining rates? Do business, I mean, excuse me, do political leaders really want to be in the business of determining rates? Do political leaders really want to be in the business of figuring out when they're going to shut off power or not? Do political leaders want to be judge and jury when it comes to, um, you know, other decisions? And again, the stuff we're talking about here in terms of building the new system isn't changed by ownership. Hi, thanks so much for a very interesting talk. Uh, it's really informative. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more. You touched on it, but I'm sure there's uh, more to it about the efforts to compensate utilities for uh, reductions in demand and for energy efficiency via the uh, idea of negawatts. If you could provide a little bit more detail on how New York is planning on doing this and what sort of the major hurdles currently are, I'd be very interested. Well, the the, the the major hurdle is really, again, this point of, of uh, the challenge to the traditional utility business model and the fact that utilities have um, been in the business, uh, or I should say, they have not been in the business in the traditional way. They have engaged in the activities of energy efficiency already. So utility rebate programs, I think we're all familiar with those. Utilities have people that are doing that, very well-meaning, but they're not doing it as a business. They're doing it as a matter of regulatory compliance. They're administering ratepayer dollars. So not only are we talking about a change in business model, we're talking about within the utility having to change uh, people that have been doing one thing and turning it from a program into a business. So that is the core of the problem. It is not the fact that we don't have the regulatory framework that it, or the financial incentives lined up. It's that uh, it's a, still a difficult thing for the utility to do from a business standpoint. Great. I'm going to sneak, sneak one in here uh, just because I think it kind of fits it. It's interesting. Um, you mentioned the 16 states who are kind of mark, more market and the 34 who are traditional rate of return. Are you pessimistic or optimistic about those numbers changing over time, perhaps with your help? Uh, you know, I think, again, the 16 states that I'm talking about, it's where generation is where the utilities are not vertically integrated. I'm not saying that 16 states are doing everything that we're doing. Um, uh, you know, I think what that raises is just the whole question of um, that there needs to be a, um, a new regulatory arrangement between the federal, federal regulatory authorities and state regulatory authorities. That's, I think, the general point that needs, that, that needs to be discussed because the current arrangement is FERC uh, is responsible for wholesale market activities and generation, and the states are responsible for what are called uh, retail markets and for uh, retail distribution. And that made a lot of sense when you had a very clear line of de demarcation between wholesale generation and distribution. But when you have electrons flowing in more than one direction from, from prosumers, that really begins to break down. And that's really the thing that we need to work on, which is more important than the, 
I think, than the issue of deregulated or integrated utilities. Great, we got one back, back here. Thank you for a fascinating uh, talk today. I have a one and a half part question. Thing. I'll, I'll give you one and a half part answer. <laughs> um, how do you approach the, the, your goal of providing clear incentives to stakeholders and market players about where the markets are going to be, especially with respect to re replacing and retiring assets on the grid that are uh, you know, carbon heavy? And uh, the part and a half is how can the people in this room sitting in a big university in California um, make their job easier? I'm sorry, how can you do the last part? How can people in this room at a big university in California make your job easier? Oh, make your job easier. Huh. <laughs> well, uh, so again, th you know, one of the good things about this, uh, the fact that we don't have integrated utilities in the state is that the risks of the ownership of the fossil plants is on to the fossil plant owners. It is not to ratepayers. That's one of the value of not being an integrated utility. Now, having said that, this is one of the issues where as states, California and New York, as we have bigger and bigger renewable mandates, we're going to have problems with, uh, with the federal government because the federal government is concerned about, the federal government regulates these wholesale markets and there's going to be concern that there's not adequate dollars in the system to support uh, the uh, fossil plants that we're going to need. So that's, I, I think, the first, first part. Look, the second, the second uh, thank you. I mean, the, your half question, you know, thank you. I, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, I, uh, I, uh, you can see that there are lots of uncertainties at the end. There's whole IT question, how we think about this IT question. That's all uh, unknown territory. So that's something that could be helpful. I think that uh, the, uh, I think the way that you can help is, you know, it's, it's, I started by talking about, uh, about uh, Justice Brandeis and states being a laboratory of democracy. It's really, in some ways, been fantastic that the federal government uh, has exited the scene. Uh, because it's required states to step up and be innovative. But the problem is that we don't know what other states are doing. It's a confederate, you know, it's you know, one of the reasons why, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, 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 the articles of, of uh, confederation didn't work so well, right? So, so it would be very helpful for us to be able to hear in New York what other states are doing and for likewise for you to help disseminate the stuff that we've been doing, because that is something which is sorely lacking when you have a bunch of s state innovation and state actors. You know, I went to Paris and we were, uh, we were called sub-national actors. And so it was really great to be a you know, sub-national actor. Uh, seeing that we're almost out of time, and on that note, uh, let's thank Richard one last time. <laughs>